Lexington. Good morning. How are you, my man? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing all right. So what is this? Do you, you are now trying an online sports talk show. Is that what you're into these days? Well, it's, it's somewhat different than um, what I've been doing as far as with my broadcast initiative. Um, I've launched a sports talk show called Fourth and Gold TV. And the reason being is because there's so, you know, there's so many other, um, there's a lot of broadcasts out there that <clears throat> are triple X oriented, but the creation of fourth and goal is really a testament to the, the motivations that I have outside and away from triple X. Uh, I'm an avid sports fan, um, and a sports historian, um, couple that with the fact that I do have, um, a skill set for, um, you know, professionally speaking. So it just made perfect sense to really delve into something that was away from triple X, uh, and to establish, continue to establish myself outside of porno. This guy is such a man's man. Listen to this. He does porno 11 inches. He's into sports, no sports history. I feel like just a total pussy right now, even talking to the guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Um, so you've always had an interest in sports, and this is something that comes naturally to you, and you 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 just wanted to give this a shot. The uh, 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 you can listen to this, and, and uh, what's a, what's the website for this, uh, Lexington, for for the Fourth and Goal show? Well, Fourth and Goal, it's, you have to go, you have to watch it. Um, it's available on UStream on the day of the broadcast. So the platform um, is Chocolate Radio, but it broadcasts uh, throughout the week on Ustream, Live 65, and also available on PS4. So the platform that I'm with, they're kind of getting their, themselves together. It's in, it, essentially, we're not too, they're not too far away from it being, you know, just on the dot-com on a particular URL instead of broadcasting. Right. On so it's not my platform. It is my, my show and my broadcast. Now, conversely, um, Lexington Still Live show is available on RadioTemptation.com, and we're the number one show on that platform currently. Um, you got into adult film at, at what age? How old did you? How old are you when you started that? Oh, let's see. Um, let's say 28. 28 when I started. Really? That's much later in life. Maybe it's different for guys and girls. Every girl that I've ever had on, they all seem to get into it about 18, 19, 20 years old. But yeah, for men, totally is it different? It's totally 100% different. For men, um, it's a grown man's game. And what I mean by that is there's a maturity level that men must have um, completely uh, different than the mentality necessary for women. But it's a grown man's game, whereas there's a maturity level that, that men achieve at their mid to late 20s. That's why, that's why you rarely see um, the men in the, in the adult industry under the age of 25. There's really no place for immaturity. Um, you know, there, cause there's a mentality of being a bull in a china closet or either being a kid in a candy store. These are things that maturity will begin to evaporate. Um, and th those that measure maturity um, is necessary for a male in adult video. You went to uh, to college. You uh, yeah. got a degree in uh, uh, what, uh, what was it? What did you get your degree in? History. History. Um, yeah, history yeah. And and uh, most people probably think of porn actors as uneducated uh, uh, druggies. Uh, that's what I think. The, <laughs> the right. I mean, that's a sort of the stereotype that people think of the porno industry. But you were an educated guy, and you go to yeah. college. You get out of college, you start working, you you get a legit mainstream job, right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you know, the thing is, is um, unfortunately, um, the, the stereotype that people uh, adhere to is a stereotype that was created, you know, way far before today's era, um, you know, the popularity of today's era has nothing to do with the 80s, where it's that stereotype may have been applicable through the 80s, uh, but as you moved into the 90s, you have people that get into the industry because they want to, not because they have to. Whereas uh, now, if you look in the, within the last 10, 10 to 15 years, people that have got into the industry uh, proactively sought the industry out, whereas 
been eras before that people kind of fell into the industry as an option, if not a last option. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, what you have is you have people, women, as a matter of fact, girls, if you will, that are graduating high school at 17 or 18 and literally going straight to an adult industry agency for representation. They've been waiting to get to the age of 18 to get into the business. So, um, in me, me in particular, yes, I you know went to college, went to a major college. Um, I was a Wall Street stockbroker for six years, and I decided to leave that to get into adult because I wanted to. And for me, it was just a matter of, of exercising the option to do so. Many people, you know, aren't given an option to chase a fantasy of theirs, and I was lucky enough to get the option to chase that fantasy. And, and I and I ran with it. I, I mean, what I, what I, led you to that? Because he, he, he's he's working in the financial uh, services industry. He's working at the World Trade Center. He's he has a college degree. Uh, what motivated you to say, you know what? I'm gonna forget all this. I'm not gonna go down the the mainstream path <laughs> path in life. I'm gonna get into adult films. Mm. Okay. Well, two things. First, there is a mis there's a great the misconception for those that, that work in the financial industry, certainly enough in New York, it's a misconception, whereas the quality of life is, is not like what people think. If you're working um, 60, 65 hours, 70 hours a week, it doesn't matter how much money you're making if there's no time to enjoy it. And there is a, um, there is a, you know, a slavish-like mentality that you have to have to become successful in that industry. So for me, quality of life became an issue, whereas if I'm working from 9 a.m. to 4 o'clock on a Saturday, having been at my desk by 7 a.m. Monday through Friday, I kind of started to think, okay, I can do this and apply this trade for the next 20 years and obviously live well, but my life would have passed me by, I felt. I thought a lot of people end up being drone-like in their commitment to those, to those industries. Now, um, ironically enough, having left the industry was the best, the left financial industry was the best I ever could have did because I would have been in my office um, on 9-11. I actually had an office on the 34th floor of Tower 2. So I, I would have definitely uh, either been running downstairs at that time or perhaps would have um, would have leapt to an untimely death out of a window. Lexington, let's be honest. You would have propped the building up with your massive dong. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, hey, I think my dong would have been somewhere tucked between my legs. At the, <laughs> you know, but uh, but no, it, it really was a case where I got a chance to get involved in in a fantasy, and you know, one, it was fun for like around ninety six, ninety seven is when I started to get involved in a few extracurricular activities. Um, and, and then that led me to meeting a photographer and then a producer uh, in New York. And they expressed to me, look, you know, you can make it, you know, you can actually get involved with this. And then once I found that I, this, that I had the skill set to do video, uh, I started to think, well, maybe I can go to California, you know, catch on out there. And if I don't catch on, I can always return to, to finance. But at the time, when you start going uh, into this line of work, there must have been something. Uh, your 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 parents, your mother, someone. This must have been in the back of your mind of what? How am I going to tell her about this or my parents or whatever? And what are they going to think? That you must have been wondering what people would, you know, how people would judge you. Well, okay. After after I got out of college, I think I was home for about a month and a half before I moved out completely. So. I would say by July of 93, I, I had not only finished college, but I had moved out of my parents' home. So from the very beginning, I started my, my life post-college. I immediately went into what I was going to be doing as a career. And so by the time I got to porno, I was 28. So um, my parents had already, you know, regarded me as a grown man and did not um, you know, reflect opinions or directives as to how I made my living because I had not relied upon them for a, a, almost a decade at that point. But you must have been nervous about telling you them about, hey, uh, you, you may hear about this from so and so. I'm I'm now making porno movies. You must have. You, there must have been some trepidation, right? No, no, no trepidation at all. As a matter of fact, um, you know, my father. Um, 
he, like I said, at the point I was 28, he he knew he recognized me as a grown ass man. So it was like if he makes that decision, you know, um, you know that was he was recognizing my maturity as a grown man. Now my mother, her perspective was simply don't get sick, um, and that uh, you know a number of physical um, you know ailments that can you know you know befall you in this industry. Right. Um, and she said don't get anyone pregnant. Uh, and I've done you know I haven't done either. Um, uh, knock on wood. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of lived up to what she asked of me. Um, but yeah, there was a little bit of, there wasn't any trepidation. It was just a matter of, of letting them know, look, um, I'm going to be getting involved in movies and they're movies that you guys don't, you know, particularly, you know, watch at all. So, um, you're going to hear, I'm doing, I'm gonna, I told them I'm going to be doing adult. Now the, the thing, the distinction is this. At, at least initially, they thought that I was going to be doing like B grade movies, like late night Showtime, late night Cinemax, Skinemax, if you will. Right. <laughs> but what happened was, um, after I won my, my first Male Performer of the Year award um, in 2000, in January, my one of my parents' friends alert tell them, "Hey, your son just won, you know, the big, you know, the big porno award." And then the next conversation with my parents was like, "Okay." So what is this? And I said, look, I said, you guys have been thinking I was doing television grade, you know, adult content. No, I'm doing the hardest of the hardcore. You know, these are movies that you guys will probably never even hear about nor see. So that was the revelation um, was just that, you know, I was doing triple X and not single X. Right, right. Yeah. You know. Did uh, uh, Lexington Steel is on with us. He has a couple of things. He has an online sports talk show called Fourth and Goal. He has his Lexington Steel live show, which airs uh, Monday nights, 8 p.m. at RadioTemptation.com. Um, let me ask you a couple of uh, questions is because you're an expert. Uh, 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 you know, you've been in the uh, porn industry for a long time. Uh, what do you think about the mandate for rubbers? Uh, I think Los Angeles, I think, mandated that. Right. Of course, everyone just moves to a different county or whatever, so they don't have to wear rubbers in their productions. But do you think that that should be mandated? What's your thought on that? Okay. Well, what's happened is uh, initially, or at least the last couple of years, it was really focused on Los Angeles County uh, in terms of uh, mandatory condom use um, and the policing of the mandates that have been authorized. So. But as of late now, they've, they've made the motive to expand it to statewide. So the whole state of California um, is looking to ban um, adult productions um, that do not include use of dental dams, condoms, um, and, and a number of other type of measures that would really curtail the growth of the industry. So people are not only moving outside of Los Angeles County to shoot, um, in which all my productions are shot, outside of Los Angeles County for more than a year now. Um, but the question is, yeah, do we move outside of California? Well, what do I think about that? I think what will happen is this. You'll have a number of adult companies and studios, if you will, that will really begin to take or go back or revert to shooting um, what's called, you know, shooting underground. And, and underground in 2014, 2015 is different than shooting underground in the 80s. Um, you know, in the 80s when they shot Underground, they meant that they were really completely clandestine in terms of, you know, it was hush-hush as to where the location would be. Um, you wouldn't find out where the location would be until the last moment. That had not been my experience because that was before I got into the industry. Underground now means that studios will not file for shooting permits. Now, when you in Los Angeles, when you're shooting any type of um, um, video or, or professional commercial vehicle, you're, you're supposed to get the shooting permits. Well, it was for commercial release. And the shooting permits are how these authorities plan to be able to police the industry. Mm -hmm. Because if you file for a permit, that means they know when and where. Now, companies will no longer file permits. And so the, the authorities, if you will, will no longer know where or when or how to police these sets. Because on any given day, there's as many as 200 to 250 productions going on at any moment in Los Angeles County. Now, the, 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 the authorities have two individuals right now in the state of California to handle this airport safety throughout the state of California. If they only afford two inspectors for the airports throughout the whole state of California, then how do they expect to have enough inspectors to track the, the hundreds, albeit the thousands of shoots happening in a given month in Porno Valley? It's impossible. Now, also, it's also a regressive financially because 
there's no way to allocate the funding to do such. So it's really uh, a, a convoluted motive by the authorities, one that's going to be very, very hard to, to, to execute and implement. Uh, that sort of brings me, Lexington and Steele's on with us. Sean has a question, sort of morphs or, 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 or is a bridges from that from that condom thing into uh, Sean, what Sean, Sean wants to talk about. Sean, you're on with Lexington and Steele. Go ahead, Sean. Yo, Rover, what's up? Hey, man. Okay, uh, Lexington, I just want to ask you, um, how widespread are STDs or how widespread were they in the industry? Because I've read something that says that they were actually more common than you think. Okay. Now, now, a lot of the reports that, that indicate numbers and percentages of STD, the presence of STDs in the industry, are, are convoluted at best, whereas they will only look at a, a, a very fine and measured um, depiction of the industry. And if you have a very narrow construct in your observation, then you can prove any, you can prove any fallacy that you attempt to do. And that's what we're seeing happening. Now, there was a study, a recent study um, released or put out by UCLA in which they purported that the numbers for STDs was much higher than one would anticipate. But what they looked at are the most, are a very narrow uh, look at the industry, whereas they're looking at a certain type of scene, certain a number of types of scenes in which the sex is very risky, whether it's anal, cream pies, double vaginal, DPs, these are not the majorities of the majority of scenes being shot. But to, to your point, the existence of STDs in history um, is, is no different than the, this, the existence of STDs in the general public. Now, what I mean by that is this. The, the percentage of the presence of chlamydia or um, gonorrhea or, um, or genital warts or any of those things the numbers in the general public are far greater than the industry. If you look at the amount, the occurrence of sexual activity, just in numbers, compared to the number of instances of the transmission of STDs, it pales in comparison to the general public. So if you have a 1,000 chances to catch an STD and only four instances of STD occur in porno, but if you look at the general public, we're at 100, at that same 1,000 instances of sex, you have 400 instances of STD. That's where you see the difference. You see, it's much, it is actually, in effect, much cleaner to work in industry because in the industry, I'm very well aware that the person I'm working with has went through a panel of nine different tests for STDs, and that person is thusly cleared of such. In the general public, when is the last time anyone to our right or our left has had an STD test, including HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, the whole gamut. When is the last time a person has done that? The, are, it, in this industry, it's every two weeks. Uh, Lexington Steele is on with us. Uh, let me ask you about something else that I think mm-hmm. is, is sort of interesting. You're a uh, black man. Um, right. Is there a level of racism in porn because I'll, I'll, the stuff I'll, I'll tell you any of the porn that I watch now is just like probably everyone else in the world it's just these short clips two three minutes that you watch on the internet no one actually goes out gets a DVD watches a whole movie anymore or anything but don't, don't believe that don't do that, don't believe that. well don't so, believe so some people are actually going out and doing well, it I guess but DVDs, DVDs the, 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 the thought that DVD sales and porn don't have diminished is a misnomer at best the powerful studios their numbers have not wavered the Smaller studios have had that, you know, have, have suffered, uh, but the larger studios, their DVD numbers have not have not um, have not diminished. But, so let me ask you about this: being a, a, a black man in the industry, a lot of the porno that I see um, that involves a black man, it's th- there's right. never really anything just that hey, it happens to be a black dude and a and and, and a white chick. I mean, sometimes it is, but there's a lot of. Um, there's, they, they, yeah, I've seen chicks uh, uh, getting banged out by black dudes and, and the chicks, you know, like, oh, yeah, F me harder, you enter, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, how does that make you feel, that kind of stuff? Well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me in terms of the type of movies that I produce for, for my fans and my constituents um, doesn't include any type of uh, uh, derogatory terms or denigration of any sort. Uh, now, the type of, of movies that you're talking about, the type of interracial movies you talk about that focus on 
on the fact that it's interracial. Yeah, sometimes they do um, try and manifest certain stereotypes. Um, what's, what I find interesting is, um, you, you know, when people ask about, you know, the racism that exists in the industry, it really is not something that is fostered by the talent. Um, the, the boyfriends and husbands and agents of our white female counterparts, um, they're being directed to stay away from interracial. So you have some girls that say, oh, I don't do interracial, but it's not her, it's her boyfriend, husband, or manager mm -hmm. that would say, you know, I don't want you doing, or I don't want you working with black men. And I find that ironic. But the funny thing about it is, uh, when black male performers are asked about the existence of racism where it concerns their female counterparts, well, none of us really care if a girl does or does not do interracial because our perspective is that it's her personal right to determine who and who not she is to work with. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, so if a girl doesn't want to work with me because she does do interracial and I am a black man, it doesn't offend me because I don't have any idea as to where the origin of that company. It may be because she's worried you're going to split her in half with that 11-inch hog that you have. Uh, that's, that, no that longer the case. that's no longer the case because now having, a, having you know, the physical attributes necessary to be successful porno is not color-specific. Yeah, yeah. But having, a large, having, a large, uh, having large physical attributes right now no longer is something that is relegated only to black male, black male performers. Do you – uh, are you – what about in your personal life, Lexington? You have a girlfriend, you have a wife, kids, anything? Tell me something about your personal life. Who are you? Do you have well, any dating, dating anyone, or what, what's going on? Well, no wife, uh, uh, no kids. Um, you know, I, I do. You know, have um, a roster of, of, of female friends that that have varying degrees of importance in my life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a roster. I like it. This guy, I'm telling you, this guy is the, this is a man's man. Sports, porn, roster of chicks. This guy's got everything going on. Um, yeah. Lexing, I wouldn't say I got everything going on, but <laughs> let's just say life is as challenging for me as it is for all of us. Well, let me, uh, I'm going to let Lexington go because I, I know he has other stuff to do. Let me quickly go to Alex, who has a question for Lexington Steele, who is on with us. He has a, a sports talk show called Fourth and Goal, which you can find online. And also is Lexington Steele Live, which you can get at RadioTemptation.com. Alex, go ahead. You're on with Lexington Steele. Hey, I just wanted to know uh, uh, who's your favorite porn star to bang out? Uh, t to date, you know, when people ask me who my favorite is, I always like to, it's difficult to really come out with one in particular. Um, so I usually offer, um, you know, my favorites in terms of, you know, different breakdowns. So if, if I say, if someone says to me, who's your favorite uh, black girl to work with, that is unquestionably Naomi Banks. If they ask me who my favorite white girl to work with, that's unquestionably Phoenix Marie. If they ask me my favorite Latina, that would be um, Kiara Mia. Uh, my favorite Asian would be Katsuni. So I, I like to just mention all four of those women because between the four of them, it's impossible to discern, to discern. But if I had to identify one, if I had to be put on an island with one woman, it would without doubt be Naomi Banks. And so she would actually represent my all-time favorite. Are you, uh, in your personal life, are you a particularly horny guy? Every guy is horny, of course, but, I mean, do you have to get it all the time? No. As a matter of fact, um, you know, quite often I, I think about how I perhaps am not as, as creative um, as creative as some directors in this industry, some of these guys have really creative minds in terms of how they arrive at the sex and what they're asking their talent to do. And that creativity is based on the fact that, that maybe I'm not as horny as others or as horny as people may think. I don't think that I'm any more horny than the, the, a regular guy. Um, it just so happened that I'm able to take, you know, my normalcy, my normal um, amorosity, if you will, and I'm able to translate that into to making video. Um, but I will say that um, one of the things about doing the indus this industry is that the women are extremely motivating in terms of their professionals at, you know, making men excited. And so it's very difficult um, for me to not be physically attracted to the women I'm working with. So 
I wouldn't say that I'm, that I'm any more horny. It's just that I have an ability to direct that 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 particular emotion, um, you know, with the lasers with the laser's edge. Uh, last uh, last uh, question from a caller. Let's go to Ron. You're on with Lexington Steel. Go ahead, Ron. Hey, Lexington. I just wanted to ask if uh, that that monster you got if that's natural or you did something. You, you worked out a lot to get it so big. I, I don't know how. But... <laughs> worked out? Yes, he was doing Wait, curls yeah. with his penis. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's really no. You know, it's funny because you know, for years I always you know when people would ask me, that, I, I would have a look on my face like, wow, that's what kind of question is that? You know, and I what the illustration I offer is this. Do, do do people that ask that question, do they walk up to people that are seven feet tall or six feet ten or six feet six and ask them, did they stretch their body <laughs> to become that tall? Yeah. You know, did Usain Bolt, did he run downhill um as a child to increase his his speed on a level plane? No, there are certain physical attributes that individuals are blessed with, and, and and sometimes you get a chance to maximize the use of that physical attribute. So and when someone asks me the question of have I done anything to augment um, my size, um, emphatically the answer is no. The, you know, I've been blessed with a physical attribute that I'm able to turn into a commercially successful business venture. You ever get? Do you ever ask your dad, like, "Hey, pops, did I get this from you, or is this inherited?" <laughs> no, no, I, I never have. You know, quite honestly, actually, I, I never have seen my parents, you know, literally have sex. So I've never seen. I mean, while I see my father, you know, perhaps walk out of the bathroom nude, I've never actually, you know, seen him in and around. See, so I would have no idea. Ironically enough. Um, it's funny to note one of the first times that my mom had came to my office, um, I have a, a huge trophy case that's behind my desk. And in that trophy case, I have my, my vibrator, you know, because uh, I have a line of novelty. Molded toy. from from you, basically? Yeah, I have 13 toys in my toy line. And so she saw my the vibrator in the, in the showcase, and she was looking at it, and, as if in awe, and I was like, yeah, Mom, you know, thank you, Mom. I put my arm around her shoulder, like, Mom, that's the moneymaker right there. Thanks very much for <laughs> kissing the cheek. So you never know, you never know where the, that gene comes from. It could come from your dad. It could come from your mom. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, you know, the, the gene for, for uh, premature balding is passed um, through, the, through your mom. Yeah. You know, that, that, you know and so... Um, and I got that from my mom because, because yeah, you know, I, I shaved my hair bald because my hairline began to recede a little bit earlier than I would have liked to hit, to it have. <laughs> so, um, so maybe, yeah, hey, maybe you got it from uh, from your mother's father or something. I guess uh, Lexington Steel is uh, he, he has a sports talk show that he's doing fourth and goal. He's very into uh, sports. He has his Lexington Steel live talk show, which airs Mondays at 8 on uh, RadioTemptation.com. Uh, Lexington, I appreciate you. And what, what's your Twitter? If people want to follow you on Twitter or whatever, what oh, is yeah. it? Okay, Lex Steel 11. So it's L-E-X-S-T-E-E-L-E 11. Very, very simple. There's a number of imposters out there, so always look for the Lex Steel 11. On Facebook, it's Lexington Steel Black Viking. So the, I, I have to do things to to make sure that the consumers can, can track me accurately because there are a lot of people that that, su- you know, that choose to represent me um, unauthorized, of course. But it happens. He's got a lot of Lexington Steel imposters out there on the yeah, internet. They're yeah. probably just trying to get chicks to, to you know mm-hmm. something, trying to pick up girls, yeah. or I don't know what they're trying to do. But I don't the, know how I, I don't know how it works or why someone would want to you know pose as someone and so, as someone else on social media, but. At first, I used to, to, it was troublesome to me. And I looked at it like, okay, they're taking money out of my pocket because if someone goes to their side as opposed to mine, they're in the wrong place. They won't be spending money at the right place. But then I thought about it, well, look, it is indeed free promotion. So it's kind of like if you have one mirror out there reflecting upon yourself versus having 20 mirrors that reflect upon yourself. And I, I say, okay, well, look, let's be comfortable with having so many mirrors that reflect upon you in some way and ultimately the people will find the right me the right rendition of lexington steel hey uh, lexington i appreciate you coming on good luck with all of your uh ventures yeah and uh and have a good one i appreciate it my man and and before we break out two things yes go go johnny mandel 
All right? That's <laughs> yeah. the main man, Johnny Manziel, who's going to do his thing out there with the Browns. All right? And go Team USA as we start the World Cup 2014 in Brazil. We got Tim Howard. We got Mike Bradley. We've got Clint Dempsey. We've got um, Josie Altador. We've got Oscar Gonzalez. Um, we have people believe in Team USA. We're down in Brazil. We need our whole nation to support our boys in the red, white, and blue. I believe that we can win. Aww. Hey, what do you think of Johnny Manziel? Is he, what do you think he's going to – how do you think he's going to perform here? First and foremost, I think that people forget that Johnny Manziel, they look at his size, and they, they say, you know, this is a guy, he's under six foot. What they forget is that this is a young man who, who not only won the Heisman, but he slayed, he carved up – the SEC, which is the most competitive conference in the United States of America. This dude sliced and diced the best defensive players for his two years on the gridiron. He's a superior athlete. And people forget, people look at his stature and say, how is this guy going to be successful? It doesn't matter what package the guy came in. The guy is a superior athlete. Do you think he'll get roughed up in the NFL, though? These guys that do a lot of scrambling and these running quarterbacks, we've seen it before. They get banged up because the game is so fast. The guys are so much bigger. Right. Uh, you think right. he can handle it physically? I put it like this. All those other guys that, that are slight of stature, whether it's Drew Brees, um, your Aaron Rodgers, um, let's go back to your Fran Tarkingtons, as of late, your, your Michael Vicks, all the guys that are six foot or thereabouts, none of them, none of them were Heisman Trophy winners. Johnny Manziel is a superior athlete, and that goes beyond whether he's 5'10 or, or the prototypical 6'5". And I will say this, if you look at the fact that that guy – was drafted in the 28th round this year by the San Diego Padres, having not played baseball. He's a shortstop. He has not played baseball since his senior year in high school, and he was drafted in the 28th round. That means there's a, he was recruited by all the top baseball schools in the U.S. That means that he's not only a superior football player, but he was a superior baseball player as well. So that, that duality dictates that the guy is a phenomenal athlete. And, and if you have phenomenal athleticism, it will trump, you know, all the other um, also rans. I mean, maybe we'll just put him on a, maybe we'll put him on a rack and stretch him out, make him taller, kind of like you did with your penis, right? Uh. <laughs> no, no, no. You can't do that. You can't do that to my man Johnny. Johnny uh. football, Johnny football will do his thing at the next level. I think if, if they rally around him and give him the, the type of offensive line um, to protect him and give him a moment, a moment to do his thing, I think that um, um, he'll prove that the next level is something that he'll do well on. Well, if, if, uh, if you come out here and you come to a game, uh, let me know. We'll get you in here. We'll, uh, we'll talk some sports with you, Lexington. And, no doubt. Uh, hey, man, uh, good luck with all your ventures. I appreciate it, my man. All right, good. LexingtonSteel.com for those who want to come and see the best in Triple X adult. There you go. Thank you. Lexington Steel.